Good morning, and welcome to the first annual Sound Education Conference. I may or may not have been up at 4.30 this morning sending emails, but um, I could not be happier to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Zachary Davis. I'm the host of Ministry of Ideas and a graduate student here at Harvard Divinity School. Um, I'm studying the philosophy of religion and the origins of modernity. So if Max Weber is your thing, come and talk to me after. Um, I'm deeply moved and inspired um, to see all of you gathered here today. Many of you have sacrificed quite a bit to be here. Um, some even traveling from as far away as Latvia and Melbourne. Go Rhiannon and Evans. I think that reveals something about the passion we have for our work and the desire we have to support one another. That is precisely why we decided to organize this conference, to celebrate educational podcasting and to build a loving and nurturing community around it. It's fitting then that we meet here at Harvard University. The word university is derived from the Latin phrase universitas, a word for when a number of individuals associate into one body. The full phrase that preceded our use of university was universitas magistrorum et scholarium. Latin scholars tell me later how to pronounce that a community of teachers and scholars. The people in this room produce shows on everything from the history of ancient Rome, to cutting edge psychological research, to mathematics, to critical theory. Together, our shows encompass the full range of scholarly inquiry. So here in the oldest and most storied university in America, we are marking the emergence of a new university, a sonic university a university that combines scholarly rigor with oral intimacy. I believe that we are at the beginning of a profound moment of democratized education through podcasting, and that all of you gathered here together are the intrepid pioneers that will blaze these new paths. And though it might seem a little strange that we're holding a conference about educational podcasting here in a divinity school, but in some ways it's the perfect place one of the most studied theological concepts is the nature and source of hope. For me, educational podcasting is a profound source of hope for a couple of different reasons. First, because it models an alternative economic system than neoliberal capitalism. I don't know anyone getting wealthy by doing educational podcasting. In fact, I don't know anyone making much money at all. And while that is admittedly a little discouraging for those of us who are drawn to make this our life's work, it is also a testimony to the purity and generosity of our motivations. Making our shows is a gift we offer to the world. We don't expect much in return, other than iTunes reviews, because we're motivated by something other than profit or fame. I think most of us are driven by the faith that no matter how small, that episode on John Singer Sargent, or Foucault, or particle physics, helps our listeners be just a little bit wiser, a little bit more humane, and a little bit more in love with the world and its infinite wonders. The second reason educational podcasting gives me hope is because the people in this community are so extraordinary. I have only been podcasting for about two years, but nearly every podcaster I meet feels like meeting a new best friend. You all have this amazing combination of intelligence, creativity, and kindness that is really stunning. And I know that you carry that selfless brilliance into your shows and into the hearts of your listeners around the world. In a time of bitter political, cultural, and economic divisions, that capacity to spread light, warmth, and love through knowledge is worth celebrating and fostering. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that for your listeners, you are not just educators, you are also ministers, therapists, and friends. Offering healing through word and sound. So for those of you who produce a show, keep going. Hopefully some conversations this weekend will inspire ways to make it even better. And for those of you thinking about starting a show, join us. 
We are here to help you at every step. Utopian visions are generally less popular than they were in previous centuries. We've been through a lot that makes us cynical. But for me, the vision of a community of friends teaching one another literature, history, science, and philosophy is the best kind of utopia I can imagine. And that is the community that we're building together, one podcast episode at a time. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Diane Moore. Diane L. Moore is the founder and director of the Religious Literacy Project here at Harvard Divinity School. She is also a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions and a faculty affiliate of the Middle East Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School. Her work is focused on advancing the public understanding of religion. She works on an astonishingly wide range of projects, including training high school and university students and teachers, foreign service officers, and even a global student body through her extremely popular online course on religion, available on edX. But there is something even more wonderful about Diane. She's the reason we're here. <laughs> Working with Diane on her online course is what inspired me to apply to Harvard Divinity School. And seeing the way Diane used scholarship to intervene on critical social challenges inspired me to develop my own show, Ministry of Ideas to not just be an exploration of scholarship for its own sake, but to use it to reshape the world along more equal, just, and loving principles. Eventually, Diane invited Ministry of Ideas to join HDS, and that is how we are able to bring you all together today in this lovely venue. Diane has profoundly shaped me for the better as a thinker and as a person, and it is my deep pleasure and honor to welcome her to speak to us. Well, the first lie of the day has been spoken. You're not here because of me. You're here because of Zach Davis. Can you give him a hand, please? It is my profound privilege to welcome you here to Harvard Divinity School. On behalf of all of us here, the dean, the faculty, our students, our staff, it is an incredible privilege to have you here. Um, and I just want to say a, a brief word. Um, about the synergy of, between Zach Davis and what we're doing at the Religious Literacy Project and uh, his important work, not only at Harvard X, which is the place we met, but his visionary work around Ministry of Ideas. Um, and I wanna, I wanna I, in my remarks this morning, I'm really thinking about his work, but I suspect it is relevant to all of you in the room, and that's why we're so excited to have you here. So let me say first, as, as Zach already mentioned, you're probably, some, maybe many of you, some of you, all of you maybe are thinking, what the heck am I doing here at a divinity school? And if you think you're having that question, you can imagine what your colleagues up in the chapel are thinking. <laughs> so I just want to say, by the end of my remarks, I hope that three things are going to be apparent to you. The first is that we share a lot in common. The work that you're trying to do through your work as podcasters, as artists, what we're trying to do here at the Divinity School. The second thing that I hope will be clear is that um, we have a lot to learn from you. And we're really, really excited to have you here with us and hope this is the beginning of a longer uh, relationship and a longer conversation. And then the third is I hope that we have a little something to maybe offer you that you might not have thought of uh, outside of this experience today not only in your opportunity to be with colleagues, but what it means to be here at a divinity school. So the first thing I want to say that I think we share uh, is that the, the, when we think about education, when we think about sound education, I love the play on words, what I would call critical education, sound education, critical education, education worthy of its name. It is not, at least aspirationally, it is not about indoctrination. It's about inspiration. And education can be both. And oftentimes it is both. But what I want to focus on here is the inspirational dimension of education, what we hope for it aspirationally. And I think there are three components of what inspirational, aspirational, sound, critical education employs. The first one is that it provides opportunities to what, what we at the religious literacy call disrupting assumptions. How can we 
the opportunity to disrupt assumptions, to help people who think they know something to think about that in a new way. And not only to just disrupt those assumptions, but to then feel inspired by that disruption, to think it then inspires curiosity and inspires potential imagination and helps people get excited about thinking in new ways about what they thought they knew. And in a sense, it is really about rethinking um, assu uh, assumptions that they, that they held. And sound education is all about that. It's about helping people think in new ways, those aha moments, those epiphanies, if you will, those places where we say, oh, I, 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 I kind of knew that, but I didn't know it in that way, and, and that energy that that can inspire. So we share, those of us here as scholars and teachers at the Divinity School, what we're trying to do with education is we want to disrupt assumptions. And there are many, many assumptions about religion that are out and popular in public discourse that really is our opportunity and our challenge, those of us who are religious studies scholars, to challenge the assumptions, the embedded assumptions about religion. The second dimension of what I think of as critical sound education is that it inspires empathy. And this is the place that you have so much to teach us. Because you in the room are master storytellers. And this, the power of story itself to inspire empathy, to have particular representations of, of particular e expressions that can invite people into seeing something new, to disrupting assumptions, but then also to inspire a sense of connection with the, the, the players, the individuals, the ideas that you're representing. And that inspiration of empathy, I think, is such a critical important dimension of our current very polarized, very binary experience of not just here in the United States, but in the larger world. And I think of that, not, it's not just that you're good storytellers, but it's something that we have to learn from you. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity to work with Zach in Ministry of Ideas to think more broadly about our larger work is, that, is the way what happens with sound education is that you limit the senses and then focus the senses. What you do with, with pause, with rhythm, with the quality of a sound, with the choice of, of music, with the way you use sound, requires something of the listener to invest him or herself into what you're doing and bring him or his, his and her imagination into the experience of a podcast. The best podcasts bring us to a different world for that 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 10 minutes, and that opportunity to be immersed in a new space that can then open up new doors for us, I think is another dimension of critical, empowering education. And the third, and this is where I'm, I'm not sure, but I hope that we have something to offer. The third opportunity uh, and representation of critical, empowering, sound education is the ability to empower agency. Now, I'm trained as a social ethicist. And so for me, education is never about itself. It's always about what are we educating for? What do we hope to invoke in our students and our listeners uh, in relationship to what it means to engage uh, in, in activity, to what, what are we going to do with the knowledge we, we gain? And that notion of inspiring um, agency, especially in a time where people feel, where agency gets uh, uh, suffocated, I think, in the face of despair. So Zach's comment about hope, I think, is a dimension of what it means to inspire agency, is to be, is to be inspirers of what I, what I call radical hope, a sense that our individual actions actually do make a tremendous difference, even in the face of the enormous odds that we face, that our individual agency is what creates the cultures where polarization, partisanship, hatred, fear reign, or where justice, hope, uh, compassion can become more powerful and profound. So I want to end, I can't help it, I'm going to end with a parable, forgive me. And the parable is really a, a, just a short story. It's about uh, a neighborhood in a city where, strangely, the culture of this neighborhood actually has represented a sense of respect for elders, which is a rare moment in itself, but it is a pocket in this community. 
And there's a particular elder, an older woman, who is known by everyone in the, in the community and who is, um, is someone who is represented as both wise, compassionate, loving, and visionary. And she's known by everybody because she sits on her porch and is out a lot. And so people see her, greet her. There's a community of young students who are not so sure about the wisdom of this woman and not so sure about what it means to respect her in the way and have her held in such high veneration. And so they devise a, a trick. And they say they're going to expose her as uh, not being at all wise and being actually quite ignorant. And, and how can a wizened old woman have much to offer anyway in our contemporary age? So their plan is they devise a plan. There are these there, the three boys and a girl. They come together and say, what, what can we do? So they devise a plan. And their plan is that they're going to capture a bird, a small bird in their hand. And they're going to go up to her. And they're going to ask her, wise woman, wise woman, I have a bird in my hand. Is it dead or alive? And they have schemed. And they say, if she says it's alive, I'll crush it in my hand and open it and expose her, her ignorance. But if she says it's dead, I'll open my hands and it'll fly free. And again, she'll be exposed. So they plan this. They're ready after school. They gather themselves. They capture the bird along the way. She walked past her house. She's sitting there on her porch, as she does. And she sees, them, she sees the, the, the children coming to her. She is excited, welcoming them, opening her arms to them. Hello, children. What? Welcome, welcome. Come into my home, she says. What can I offer you? And they say, no, 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 we, we just have a, a very quick question. So she says, OK. So she's paying careful attention. She says, wise woman, wise woman, I have a bird in my hand. Tell us, is it dead or alive? She pauses, and she ignores the cynicism. She looks with compassion at each one of their faces, slowly paying attention to each child individually, not saying anything, just looking at them, pondering. They start to get restless, un nervous that under, under her long gaze. T answer us. We have, we have to go. To an give us the answer. So she pauses. She looks again at the child holding the bird. And she stands up slowly, holds her hands around the hands of the boy holding the bird. And she says, my son, the bird is in your hands. How can we inspire our listeners, our students, to know that the bird is in our hands? We are the agents of change and of hope, or potentially the agents of despair. How do we break through the zero-sum binaries that are so present in our current culture? I think it's through story. I think it's through imagination. I think it's through artistry. And I think it's through hope. And all of you in this room have tremendous gifts in all of those, uh, all those representations. And we, again, are so happy to have you here. We look forward to learning from you. And thank you both for your work and for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, you can all see why I love her. And now to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Liz Covart. Liz Covart is the creator and host of the wildly popular Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, winner of the Best History Podcast Award in 2017, as the digital projects editor at the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. Liz practices a blend of scholarly history, public history, and digital humanities. While the OI's primary focus is supporting scholars and scholarship related to early America, broadly understood, Liz experiments with social and new media to communicate scholarly history to large public audiences, which is what she'll do today. She believes if granted convenient access to the work of historians, 
the public will take an interest in history and become interested in it. Liz earned her PhD in history from the University of California, Davis. And when I would tell people that Liz Kovar was going to be an opening keynote, it got people really, really excited. I don't know if there's anyone more beloved in the educational podcasting world than Liz. So please join me in welcoming her. Well, I'm really excited to be here. When I first started attending podcast conference, they'd be like, you have a podcast in history? It's not a business podcast? And be like, no, I have a podcast about history. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to be amongst all of you who have educational podcasts or aspiring educational podcasting um, in mind. Now, I've been pondering a question for the last couple of years, and that's, what can the history of radio teach us about the present and future of podcasting? And I'm curious about this because if you read the headlines, podcasters invent serial podcast. Podcasters basically invented audio. Um, and I just like, as a historian, I'm like, no, everything has a history. Certainly podcasting comes from someplace else. Uh, and a lot of what podcasting has become is actually deeply rooted in the history of radio. Whether we know it or not, we've picked up on funding models, audio formats, and things that had already developed in the heyday of radio in the 1920s and 1930s. So what I thought I would do is give you a brief history of that history of the 1920s and 1930s in radio to show you where things like educational um, audio had come from and to actually talk about why educational audio never became a thing in the United States and where I think podcasting can fulfill this kind of lost promise of radio. And then if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about my story, um, which will be just one of many inspiring stories that you'll come across um, during this event. So the history of radio starts with this guy. I'm going to butcher his Italian name because I don't speak Italian, but Guillermo Marconi. He was an Irish-Italian man, and he invented something called wireless telegraphy. Now, you've probably heard of the telegraph, right? You know that it has wires. You can send dots and dashes over that wires and Morse code and send messages. And this was a huge thing, especially in the United States, because you could send a message coast to coast. Well, what Marconi did was he revolutionized it. Now you could send those dots and dashes through the ether, the upper, the upper air, wirelessly. And this gets to be exciting in the United States because in 1899, no, he, yes, 1899, George Gordon Bennett, the publisher of the New York Herald, invites Marconi to come over and debut his device here. He wants him to broadcast the America's Cup yacht race in New York City Harbor. And he pays Marconi, offers him $5,000, which is the equivalent of about $152,000 today to do it. So the yacht race goes off, and Marconi's basically giving you a play-by-play -play with his wireless telegraphy device. Now, the wireless telegraphy device was really exciting to men like Bennett, because he's a newspaper man. You need news to fill your newspaper. Well, to get his news, he was using the telegraph a lot. Well, that cost a lot of money. So he was hopeful that having this device would add some competition to the marketplace. So what ends up happening is wireless telegraphy comes in. By 1901, you could send messages across the Atlantic wirelessly. In 1901, I know this sounds probably not as exciting as it was, Marconi sends the letter S from Cornwall, England to Newfoundland. And thus, now again, we have transatlantic communication that way. So it cost people like Bennett, newspaper men who use this device all the time, 10 cents per word. If you're just a business that, you know, or the government, you pay 25 cents per word, which doesn't sound like a lot, except that's about $7.62 per word today. So this is an expensive, technology, but it's exciting. Now, Marconi always thought of it as a point-to-point -point communication device. You are a specific sender. You have a specific message that you'd like to reach someone else on the other end. He never imagined that he could use this to send voice or radio. It was just simply a wireless Morse code device. And this was okay because it left room for innovation. Two engineers, we have um, Lee, uh, Reginald Fessenden and Lee DeForest. Fessenden invented this device here, which is the alternator transmitter. It makes it possible to send voice wirelessly through the ether. And then Lee DeForest invented the audion tube, which is that glass tube he's holding in his hand. And that allows the radio to receive the voice um, from the ether. And this kind of led, these technological developments led to the first radio boom. If you know a lot about history, you know that Americans like to speculate on everything. Usually land, sometimes sports. There was speculation on radio. 
Between 1906 and 1910, Americans were basically buying stock in any sort of radio company they could, whether it was the American Marconi Company or engineering houses like Westinghouse that were producing radio-like components. It also got amateurs excited. If you think about like podcasting, we're kind of the equivalent of like the early DXers in the space. That's what they were called. Basically, you'd buy a DIY kit or the components you need for a radio, and you construct your own radio. This was particularly popular among middle class men and boys, white men and boys, because they had disposable income and the ideas that they should be engineering and engineering like. Well, they put together these radio sets, and the competition became how far can I send my signal? How far can I receive a signal from? And the further you could go on either end was kind of like a mark of your, edu uh, of your engineering prowess. The problem was, as more and more people got into radio, the more crowded the airspace became. And this became especially acute after the invention of this, carbonundrum, which is a man-made silicon crystal. And you need a crystal to tune in the radio waves. That had been expensive to produce until they come across carbonundrum. And then all of a sudden, the price of radios and their equipment start to drop. Um, so by 1912, to give you an idea, the New York Times reported that there were several hundred thousand Americans on the airwaves. And what does that mean? Well, you could broadcast on any frequency you wanted. So you can send your dots and dashes through the ether. This is still slightly before voice. You could send your dots and dashes through the ether um, and, and get it to be heard, and you can tune in. So if the government's got something good going on, like the Navy or the Coast Guard, you could tune into their frequency and listen along. The government starts talking about regulations, and they do need to start putting regulations in place, especially by 1912. You might have heard of a ship called Titanic. Well, there hadn't really been regulations to make sure that you'd have a wireless telegraphy device on board your ship. Some countries had it, some countries didn't. Titanic, this supposedly modern, unsinkable ship, was cruising through the North Atlantic, making its way from England to New York City, going a bit too fast, and hit an iceberg. They start sending out the SOS and messages across their wireless telegraphy device. But this is how crowded the airspace was. As soon as people start hearing that Titanic hit an iceberg, they start chiming in, are my friends and family OK? Some of the pranksters are on there sending other messages. So at some point, a message goes out, hit iceberg, now making way to Canada. But we know that Titanic never makes its way to Canada. About 1,635 people die on board um, as, as Titanic sank. So there was pressure on Congress to do something. So they passed the Radio Act of 1912. And basically what they said is, labor, the Secretary of Labor and Commerce, you are now permitted to license radio stations. If you want a radio station, you have to prove that you know Morse code, and then you have to prove that you know how to use your radio equipment. So you had to actually take a test and be licensed. If you're an amateur, they regulated you. You're not longer allowed. You could listen in on any frequency, but you can't broadcast on any frequency anymore. They relegate them to the short waves, the low end of the bandwidth, 200 meters or less, which means you can't really broadcast too far, and there's lots of interference. But this is where the amateurs are right, uh, regulated, too. And if you were caught on one of the bigger bandwidths that's operated by the US Navy or a company like Marconi, that could be a fine of $500 to $2,500, which today is $13,000 to $65,000. So that's a serious fine. Um, but that's what the government decided to do um, to bring order to the airwaves was they're going to regulate them. Now, the radio as we knew it came about because of this man, Frank Conrad. He was a Westinghouse engineer, and in 1916, he took out a radio license called KDKA 360 in Pittsburgh. You might have heard of them because they're still active today. In his garage, the station was licensed to his garage. He was just experimenting. He took a bit of a break during World War I. We went back to it after World War I, and he one day took his phonograph out to his garage, hooked up his mic, and basically started broadcasting music. So one of the very first music broadcasts goes out over KDKA 360. And Westinghouse is like, this is ingenious. I love what I hear. If we have content out on the airwaves, people want to buy a radio to hear it. And so what they do, they, they built Conrad a bigger station in downtown Pittsburgh, and he starts broadcasting all sorts of things, radio, sports, election results, news and information that people could use. And this created an opportunity to sell more radio station, you know, radios. But it also became something that educators looked to. 
Educators were some of the earliest innovators in radio, especially in terms of, of the technology and the programming. They start to think of this, okay, okay, if we can send voice and music out on the airwaves, surely we can send knowledge. So one of the earliest experimenters is this guy here. His name is Earl Terry. Um, he's from the University of Wisconsin, and he represents just one of the many educators who were experimenting by ra with radio. By January of 1923, there were 72 colleges and universities that had licensed radio stations because they believed in this educational moment. Well, what Terry does with the University of Wisconsin's radio station, which was 9XM, which is today WHA, um, he starts sending weather reports, at first with Morse code, but weather and market reports to the farmers around him. And he had quite a following because farmers need these market reports and weather reports so they know when to harvest and sell their crops. By 1919, he started experimenting with vacuum tubes. And by 1920, he was experimenting with voice and sending out voice broadcasts, again, usually with weather and market reports. And you could hear those all the way down in Texas. Um, so the power of radio is increasing. There were also a bunch of amateur radio experimenters living in places like Lafayette, Indiana, where you would find John Fetzer. He owned the radio station 9FD. And so this guy, um, president of Emanuel College, Frederick Briggs, um, goes down to Lafayette and says, hey, you know, radio's really hot right now. We love what you're doing. Why don't you bring your radio station to Emanuel College in Berrien Springs, Michigan? And we'll have students help you um, with your radio. We can teach them how to use the technology. And we can even have some of our professors put out educational programming over your airwaves. So men like Fetzer end up joining colleges even if a college didn't have a radio station. Students were, colleges really want this because students were interested in the technology. And I think of that today when we talk about podcasting is there are some transferable real world skills that students could be learning. It was the same with radio. Colleges were also excited because you have men like Terry broadcasting market reports and weather reports to farmers who need them. And that's a mission of a land grant college is to support the surrounding agriculture and farmers of their state. But other professors saw it as an opportunity to broadcast their work to a broader audience. Have you ever heard of a MOOC, a massive on open online class? Yeah, that started with radio in 1922. The University of Nebraska at Lincoln decided, hey, we're going to offer a class. We're going to broadcast it at a set hour every week. Um, and when we're broadcasting it, anybody can listen and learn from it. But if you want to pay us $12.50, which is the equivalent of about $183, you can take the class, we'll grade your examination, and if you pass the class, we'll give you two college credits for it. Well, people were really into this. It was so successful, lots of colleges and universities start adopting these radio courses. And the question became, though, if we're really eager to use this as a way to bring out our education, how do we do two things? One is, how do we continue to fund this? As we know as podcasters, radio content is free to consume. It is not free to produce. Same with podcasting. Podcasts free to consume, not to produce. So how do we fund it? The other question that came to be was, how do we as educational radio broadcasters compete with big time network radio? So to understand that we really need to understand something about the rise of the National Radio Service. A lot of Americans believe that radio could be something that united the American people. Remember, we're a country that stretches over 3,000 miles from coast to coast, and you have farmers in Iowa wondering what people in New York City are doing, and people in New York City wondering what people in Louisiana are doing, and people out on the West Coast wondering you know, what's going on just along their coast, let alone in the middle of the country in the East Coast. And people thought that they could create a sense of national identity if we had uniform programming that everybody could listen to when it was on. The problem was wireless telegraphy, the wireless technology, wasn't big enough, it wasn't robust enough at that point to support that kind of transmission. So the only way to get national programming from coast to coast was to do it along a wired network. And there was one wired network, AT&T. They had the telephone lines, and they said, sure, you can use our telephone lines. We're happy to let you do it. By the way, here's your big rent bill. So then the question is, OK, well, how do you pay to get your content on the air? And it was decided that the most efficient way was to create a stable 
of high quality content programming that you could sell to advertisers who would support not only the production of the show, but the rent on the wires, and then hopefully generate some sort of profit. Because of the way that radio was funded with these sponsors, educational radio kind of took a back seat, especially after the passage of the Radio Act of 1927. The Radio Act of 1927 superseded the Radio Act of 1912 and basically created the FRC, the Federal Radio Commission, which was just the predecessor to the FCC. And what they did was is they started giving preference to be, you know, of the better airwaves, the really strong ones, to network radio, you know, network radio, so your NBCs and your CBSs. And this was a problem because basically what happened is ele educators were relegated to a kind of a weak part of the bandwidth, and they were told that they had to share that bandwidth with other broadcasters. So you would basically be like, hi, University of Wisconsin, you're only allowed to broadcast Monday through Friday between the hours of, say, 1 and 3 p.m. And then the rest of that time would belong to some other group or um, educational institution. What happens to that MOOC? University of Nebraska having really big success, having this class out there that people are chiming into, that they're listening into and, and learning something. Well, the students start reporting that they can't hear what's going on. People aren't respecting these hours of broadcast. And other bigger stations are kind of butting into the airspace. So there's lots of static, lots of interference. And so what happens is, is a lot of educators end up pulling out of radio. It was expensive to operate a radio station. And by 1933, it would cost a college about $31,300 in equipment, which is roughly about $600,000 today. And that's just the equipment. Then you had to staff it. And of course, they do those things that universities do, where it's like this department donates this many hours, and they're paying for it out of their budget lines. But just the radio budget line might be $10,000, which is roughly about $200,000 today. So when it became clear that they couldn't get their message out, the educational institutions start to pull out. Well, nonprofit foundations, I'm sorry, I'm just a couple slides behind here. But nonprofit foundations like the Rockefeller Institute, the Payne Fund, later the Ford Foundation would come in and said, no, education is really important. We want it to serve the public interest. And they start organizing the educators to agitate for a new bill in government. And they get it in the Telecommunications Act of 1934. The problem was, it didn't really change much. There was a lobby from the big networks that said, well, you, the, these educational radio stations, they're agitating for 25% of the powerful dial. They don't really need that because we have plenty of time on our powerful radio stations to broadcast their content. And Congress believed them, so they didn't really change much. Um, educational radio doesn't really get a leg up. But the thing that changes is because the big networks made such a big deal about having airtime for educators, they actually had to pony up a little bit um, and pony up some of that, that airtime. But what the education, you know, what the networks want is to provide high quality educational content that they can sort of design. So rather than going to the colleges and universities, for the most part, to develop education, there are cases where they do, like with the Chicago, University of Chicago Radio Roundtable. Um, that, they, that, that the Rockefeller Institute funded. Um, but most of the time, they would just create their own educational programming. And we see this in the 1920s with the creation of NBC's Music Appreciation Hour with Walter Damrosch. Walter Damrosch was the conductor of the New York Symphony Orchestra. And he would get on the radio dial uh, on the station from, on Fridays from 11 to noon. And he would talk about music and educate people about music. But this becomes a common theme for educational programming. They don't get the prime time spots. They don't get when people are listening. Think about what you're doing today between the hours of 11 and 12. I bet you it's not turning into the radio um, to learn something. It's, well, you're going to learn something because you're here today. But the thing is, is that's not something that masses of people do. So they really only are allowed to build up a limited audience. And to give you an idea is after World War II, the solution to educational programming and providing it is to subcontract out to the Canadian Broadcasting Company and the British Broadcasting Company um, and get their educational programming, which is state supported. And so by, after World War II, by 1946, there's 50 hours per week of CBC and BBC produced educational programming broadcast on American airwaves. But again, it's relegated to these off hours, midday, midweek hours where not a lot of people can tune in. So it only had an estimated uh, 
listenership of about three million people. And we've heard podcasts who get more downloads than that. Um, so it's you know not necessarily a whole lot going on. So in terms of why educational radio really failed to take hold in the United States, it had to do with limited space on the radio dial and a big regulation of that radio dial, and it's still re regulated today. It had to do with how they funded it. So if you um, want to get big sponsors for your show, it's a little different now because I'm thinking about podcasting, but for radio, is you needed to have some sort of homogenized content that people were interested in that they could sell um, to sponsors, and that wasn't typically um, educational programming. But podcasts, I think, can hold, can fulfill a lot of this lost promise of radio because we're not, as of yet, really regulated by anything. So anybody can have a voice, anybody can produce a show. As of now, server space is basically unlimited, and that's what you need to, to host your content and your, and your RSS feed. Um, so we're okay with that. So the, the space is wide open, and we can do a whole lot and inspire a whole lot of people, educate and uplift them through the power of podcasts. And I have a few minutes, so I'm just going to breeze through my story quickly because, again, it's just an example of what, of what one can do. So I finished my PhD in 2011 and decided I didn't want to be a professor. But I'd worked in the National Park Service, and I had this public history bug. So I basically decided that what I wanted to do was write a lot of books and articles and kind of podcast on the side. I'd started listening to podcasts pretty late, 2012. I read about them in a book, like a good historian. And then I was like, whoa. I was basically learning skills I didn't learn in grad school, how to market, how to you know, organize things. I loved it, and then I went to look for a history podcast, but I couldn't find one I liked. And I understand, I'm a little bit of a niche market. I had my PhD in early American history. I wanted a show about early American history, and there wasn't, as of yet, one out there. And I didn't want you know, an overview. There's a lot of overview podcasts. I wanted something that went deep into the details um, and yet was still kind of accessible. But I couldn't find a show like that. So I said, OK, I'm going to create a podcast. And then like a good historian, I researched podcasts for 18 months because <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend it, but you know, I was going to be prepared. But why the National Park Service thing is relevant is I worked there what I call during a magical time. It was between 2001 and 2005. And I basically saw the power of history when it's communicated well. In the fall of 2002, this guy, David McCullough, publishes this biography of John Adams. People started coming to the Boston National Historical Park, which is where I worked. And rather than asking me where Harvard, where Fenway, and where Cheers was, <laughs> they started being like, where did Joseph Warren fall in the Battle of Bunker Hill? How did the British burn down Bo Charlestown during the battle? How did the people of Boston even survive that British occupation between 1775 and 1776? All of a sudden, it's not like I had you know, bad times early on. I enjoyed my job, but the job got more enriching. I was really engaging people with history, and I'm like, this is great. And later, I would figure out through observational data and collection here, it was because of this book. Initially, people would be like, yeah, I read this book, John Adams. It was great. A year later, it was like, yeah, I didn't really like history, but then I read this biography of John Adams. And it was great, but my favorite was usually like, yeah, I used to really hate history, but then everybody was reading this book, John Adams, and I felt like I needed to read it, but now I love history. I mean, this guy, the well-communicated history, I know the book has some flaws. He created FOMO about history, fear of missing out. <laughs> this, was, this was great, so I applied to grad school to work with master interpreters and master writers. Um, as I said, I decided at the end I didn't necessarily want to be a professor, so I get into podcasting, write my books and articles, get into podcasting, start Ben Franklin's world. I thought that podcasting would be a good way to convey history just because of who listens. Um, these are like the Edison um, statistics about pod listener growth, so there's lots of people listening, it's increasing. For history in particular, and I would imagine this similarly for educational podcasts, it fits the demo de NPR demographic. Our show has about 80% of non-historians listening, which is exactly who I wanted to target, the people I was meeting at the Park Service. Um, and lots of them are finishing the episode, so I thought it would be really powerful. I also had a couple questions inspired by my Park Service, um, service, which is people keep saying people aren't interested in knowledge or history, but I didn't think that was the case because of who I was meeting at the Park Service. So I said, could podcasts help me answer this question once and for all, were people interested in scholarly history? And by that I mean the well-researched stuff, not the fluff, but the, the really in-depth stuff. 
And if they were, would they seek it out? Would they go to a historic site? Would they check out a book from their library or even purchase a book if they knew where to find it? And once I launched my show, it started in October of 2014. Um, I had 288 downloads. I thought that was great. I mean, 288 people in a room would be really impressive, right? But then it just exploded. Like within a couple months, you know, I was averaging 25 to 26,000 downloads a month. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, all of a sudden sponsor interest. Um, I don't know what to do about sponsors. You know, you probably hear from people, sponsors are a little bit complicated. I'd get notes from colleagues like, can I be on your show? And I was a little confused by that because it was like, it might not be a good fit, but how do I tell them no when I'm gonna see them at the next conference? So I had a lot of business side of history uh, questions and I reached out to the Omohundro Institute, which is the Institute of Early American History and Culture. They've been producing the journal in the field for years and some of the best works. And I knew that they supported scholars and scholarships, so I just kind of randomly emailed a person I knew over there, the director, and I just said, hey, I have this kind of crazy project with business side of history problems. Do you think we could talk over lunch? And what that led to was a really fruitful partnership called Doing History. It's a series that's actually right now running on the podcast, and it's about showing the process of history. Listeners weren't just interested in history. They wanted to know how historians do their work. So right now we're running a, an, a series on biography. What is biography as a genre? If people are using it as a gateway to history, what, what is it designed to do? Why are we so into it? Why can it open up the past? And so we're exploring that in four episodes. In our first season, we explored the process of how historians work. How do they research? How do they write? How do they interpret a historical source? And we found these episodes were really popular with listeners. So while we normally offer interviews with historians, um, in these, this specific series, we are talking about process. And it's been exciting because your podcast can be more than just a podcast. I believe that the future of scholarship is multi-platform. I believe that it's going to be a collaborative space. And I believe that if you have a podcast, you can drive people to a book. If you have a book, you can drive people to a blog post. And if you have a blog post, you can drive people um, to an app or even someday virtual and augmented reality apps. And we're playing with this at the OI. So the first side is one we partnered with a cultural institution and we, that's an interactive graphic of the Declaration of Independence. We do have our podcast and of course we connect it when we can with the William & Mary Quarterly, um, which has been the journal in the field for the last uh, 20, uh, 75 years. So I do think um, the future is bright and it starts, it can start with a podcast, but it's going to be more, even more multi-platform than that. So that's where I'm gonna leave my story. If we catch up, I can tell you about it more in detail. I encourage you to ask others about their stories too, because not only if you're a veteran or a newbie is it inspiring uh, to find out how people got into podcasting and what they're doing with it, but it's also a great way to learn and to figure out new tricks about how to podcast, what's working in a science podcast that could work in a history podcast and vice versa, um, or even other subjects. So I do, because I'm a nerd, I have a free bibliography about all the stuff I've collected on the history of radio that I, I couldn't even get into. And if you text um, OI News to 33444, you'll get that. Um, and you can also sign up for their newsletter to keep up on the podcast and whatnot. And then, of course, my email. So thank you very much on that whirlwind tour. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, before we break, I'd like to give a few, a few pieces of logistical information um, and offer some thanks. So there's staff members wearing red sound education shirts. They can help you find the bathroom and solve problems. Uh, they're all here to help. Um, we're selling those shirts, and we have even nicer tote bags. So if you want to bring some swag back to your friends, um, or just support the conference, but still get something in return, you can buy that. Um, there's a limited number of the booklet programs. Couldn't afford as many as we wanted. Um, so please use that as a chance to share and make a friend. And don't throw them away, but uh, if you can, give them back to a staff member and so we can collect them for tomorrow. Um, don't feel like you have to go to everything today. We know there's so much. It's, you know. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't want you to be, to be anxious. Um, so we're gonna try to record it all. Um, we want you to have conversations in the hallway uh, and, and make friends. If you wanna help us record, 
Um, you can use your own recording device for your piece. You can even just stick your iPhone in front of you, know, in front of you and we'll get it that way. Um, somehow, it's collaboratively, we're gonna capture everything. Um, it's okay to leave, to switch panels, to kind of get up and go around. It's a fluid space, spontaneous. Uh, don't, don't take it, you know, speakers don't be offended. Um, and um, if it ends up becoming too crowded in the hallway or you need some kind of space, Rockefeller Hall is sort of roughly that way if you keep going outside over there. There's a cafe, there's open common space. It's easy to find a little corner. Um, we also have recently added a special conversation that I wanted to give some attention to. Um, today at 1.20 p.m. in the Divinity Hall Chapel. Divinity Hall is a building about a three minute walk up. Um, you can see it on the map. Um, Anya Grundman, who's the NPR Senior Vice President for Programming and Audience Development, will be uh, having a conversation about how NPR thinks about education um, and some of the, the trends that they're, they're trying to follow and, and that they're, you know, they're just trying to copy us. We all, we all know that. Um, so please say hello, be friendly with everyone, um, be inclusive, and uh, this evening we'll wrap up the day with a keynote with the great John Bewin from Scene on Radio. He'll be giving a closing keynote at the Geological Lecture Hall. It's part of the Museum of Natural History. Um, and right after, we'll be having a kind of reception party at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. There may be Dia de los Muertos altars, be warned. Um, use our social tags, sound underscore edu, and use our hashtag at uh, hashtag soundedu18 whenever you post. We'd love lots of photos, be really helpful. All right, so a few thanks and then I'll let you go. Um, I'd like to thank my two conference co-chairs, Joseph Fridman and Doug Metzger. Um, without them, this could not have been possible. I would have collapsed many, many times. Um, also, some special thanks to our design team, which made our great branding um, and, and materials. This is Doug Thomas, Henry Becker, and Nock Doan from the Inscription Design Studio. If you need design help, talk to Nock. Um, my Ministry of Ideas colleagues, Galen Beebe and Nick Anderson, um, and my, my other ones. Um, my Hub and Spoke network mates, Tamar Abishai and Wade Rausch. My HDS colleagues, especially Katie Caponera, and Julie Shapiro, Chris Kremitzos, and Ever Gonzalez, who all provided this totally conference novice, some extremely invaluable experience on how to put this all together. Um, but there will be mistakes, and forgive me in advance. Uh, deep thanks to my wonderful co-conspirator conference volunteers, Kip Clark, Eric Jones, Emily Parks, Mayan Plout, Joshua Ray, Catherine Serafin, Shira Talushkin, Vanya Vishkin, Steve Young, Morgan Jaffe, Lucia Viviciencio, Ferran Du, Annie Davis, and Nancy. We also want to thank our conference partners, WGBH, Forum Network, Open Source, Hub and Spoke, PRX, Radio Public, Outlier, PodFest, Panoply Megaphone, Audio Boom, Himalaya, PodSound, Blueberry, Hindenburg, Castbox, Ad Results Media, Interview Valet, and Podcast Success Academy. Thank you to everyone who's helped bring us together. Now let's break and have some fun. Thank you.